So the Hand of Fellowship, which you all just participated in, I want you to take a minute and think about the hand that you shook. Was it warm or was it cold? Was it a firm shake or a tender shake? Was it a rough hand or a smooth hand? You just touched flesh and blood of another human being. And by way of introduction, I want you to keep that in mind as I go into today's teaching. I want to teach on the incarnation. 101. But you know, in the Lord, there's no 101, right? You can go as deep as you want with the simplest verse in the Lord. The incarnation, back to basics. I felt like I wanted to get back to basics. The almighty, eternal I am. In human form. And there are a couple points I want to make today. I'm going to, you know, this is a traditional sort of Western way to teach. Tell them what you're going to teach, then you teach it, and then you tell them what you taught. They don't do that in other parts of the world. But there's a couple of points I want to make. One is, of course, about the incarnation of Jesus Christ, what that means. What happened? Why did he do that? And the other is, what does that mean for my body? Because I realized I have not been treating my body well. I have not thought of my body as a gift from God. I have dissed my body. Why was I five foot eight at age 12? You know, why don't I have the metabolism of somebody who's the pencil thin? Why is my hair the way it is? You know, so on and so on and so forth. I'm sure you've done the same thing. But our bodies are a gift from God. So I hope to bring out those two points today because they're related. Now, there are clues early on in the book of Genesis, God created the material world out of material. All right? He's not just floating around and having us float around in spiritual form for some reason or another. It's a material world. He could have done it any way, but he did it that way. And we are a material body. We have a soul and we have a spirit. But let's not forget that we have a body. The Jews didn't think it didn't forget that. The Greeks might have started to think otherwise. The Greeks got into the philosophy and the head and the intellectual, and before you know it, the body wasn't as important. The Jews always consider the body important. We should consider the body important. And even though Romans 8 makes it clear that the body should be subservient to the spirit, yeah. right? We nevertheless have a body. That's right. We could have not. But we do. And when Jesus touched each person, he didn't say to the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, my daughter, you now have eternal life. And it'll be so much easier for you to suffer with the bleeding for the next 40 years. No. He healed her body. Yes, that's right. That's right. And he didn't say to the man at the pool of Siloam, my son, you now have eternal life and salvation. So don't worry about trying to get into the pool. You can just enjoy sitting under the canopy crippled for the next 40 years. Right? He didn't say that. Everybody's body was healed. When John the Baptist sent his messengers, John was in prison his last days. This is it. He sends his messengers to Jesus. Are you the one? Are you the one? Are you him? And Jesus didn't say, John, wait till we get into the by and by. You'll see it all. No. What did he say? The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. Their bodies were healed. Let's not forget that. It's part of salvation message. Now, one of my more recent favorite authors, Abigail Favalli, said this beautiful thing. Our bodies are sacramental sign of the hidden mystery of God. Have you ever thought of your body as a sacrament? What is a sacrament? 
Anyway, marriage is a sacrament. It's considered a sacrament because it's a mystery that holds a greater meaning, right? Your body is a mystery. It holds a greater meaning. It's a sacramental sign of the hidden mystery of God. And I found this great quote by John Paul II, the body makes visible what is invisible. My body makes visible to you what is invisible, the spiritual and the divine of me, my person. Christ makes God visible. The church is the bride made visible, right? So obviously our physical bodies are important to God. The body reveals to us the eternal and divine reality of that person. Remember the hand you shook? The body reveals the eternal and divine reality of that person, a reality that can only break into tangible, sensible world through embodiment. Embodiment, mm -hmm. right? Have you ever thought of your body as a sacrament? Well, maybe you might want to think about it that way. And others' bodies as well as a sacrament, as a gift. If you've dissed your body, repent. Your body is a gift from God. It is a temple. Now, let me get back to the incarnation of Christ because it's related. Now, the definition of incarnation means incarne, carne as flesh, in the flesh. When you have chili con carne, you have chili with meat, right? That's what it means, in I didn't say chili with flesh because it's a disgusting image. You have chili with meat. Incarne means in the flesh. A person who embodies in the flesh a deity, a spirit, or an abstract quality, right? And Britannica, the Encyclopedia Britannica makes it clear. It's a pretty foundational doctrine in the Christian church that God became flesh and assumed a human nature. He humbled himself. He didn't humiliate himself. It's not a humility to be a human being. Be careful. That slips in in subtle, unseen ways. He humbled himself. God, the God of all creation, the great I am, humbled himself and came into a bodily form. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us as a little baby, a little egg, a little sperm that came together, two cells, four cells, eight cells, 24 cells, and so on and so forth. He did it like the rest of us did it. The great eternal I am. Now we've been studying the names of God, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Sedkanu, and so on and so forth, Jehovah. Jehovah is a transliteration of Yahweh. Yahweh is the pronounceable form of YHWH, which was an intentionally an unpronounceable name of the almighty great I am God who cannot be contained in a single name. The Jews said, we're going to put this placeholder in here every time we talk about him because he cannot be contained in a single name, the great I am. We're going to call it an unpronounceable Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, Yahweh. And then, of course, they put vowels in to pronounce it, Yahweh, Yahweh. And then they translated it to Jehovah, Jehovah said canoe, Jehovah Nisi. But when Mary met Gabriel, the angel, and was impregnated, he said, you shall call him by the name Jesus. Jesus is a form of Yeshua, which in Hebrew is Yeshua, which is a form of Joshua, which is a form of Jehovah, which is a transliteration of Yahweh, which is the placeholder name for the great I am uncontainable God contained in a name mm -hmm. right. and no other name by which we are saved but the name of Jesus. All who call on the name of Jesus will be saved. <laughs> Embodied 
the great eternal I am. How is that possible? Embodied with a name, yes. Jesus. Why? Well, we see signs of it early on, by the way. You know, in Genesis, he talks about the seed. That's a tangible material thing that's coming, the seed that will crush the head of the serpent. And later, the tabernacle, one of my favorite subjects, our favorite subject in this church, the tabernacle. Moses went up the mountain for 40 days. He didn't come back down with directions for how to sit cross-legged and meditate and become one with a great single mind, Right? Why did he come down? He came down with laws for the material and spiritual world. And he came down with a, a very peculiar and very intense detailed design for a building. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Made out of earth and gold and metals and animal flesh and flax and what have you. A building that is a form of Jesus. It is the ministries of Jesus in a material form where man was going to meet with God with a material form. So it was a kind of picture of Jesus who came down, manifest as a real person, not a Christ consciousness, but a real person. And then, of course, it goes on from there. We, this very fragile imperfect thing is a temple for the Holy Spirit of God and that's not all then we finally have the heavenly tabernacle in the book of Revelation where God dwells with his people in a material world let's not diss the material world and what did Jesus show us of the divine Titus did a beautiful job. Chapter 2, he says, For the grace of God has appeared. Yeah. Wait, wait, grace is intangible. The grace of God has appeared in him, in Jesus. In Titus chapter 3, For the kindness and love of God has appeared. Kindness has appeared. Love has appeared in a person. Of Jesus. And then, of course, in John 1 1, you all know the Word of God made flesh in a person. Why? Why? Why did Jesus have to be? Why did God have to come and humble himself into a human, fragile human form? Well, I'm going to give you four reasons. Maybe you can come up with some others. One, he came to reveal the Father mm -hmm. to us. In real life, IRL. <laughs> if you ever wondered what IRL was, in real life. Now, you have to say that today. <laughs> in real life he was the compassion of God the overpowering love of God the marvelous grace of God made manifest in human form in John 1 the word became flesh the word of God became flesh in a human being John 14 John said to Philip Anyone who has seen me in personhood mm -hmm. has seen right. the Father. Right. Yeah. And Hebrews 1, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being in the flesh. Yes, that's right. That's right. And Titus, I've already mentioned, he's the grace of God, the kindness of God, the love of God in the flesh. That was number one. Number two, he came to redeem mankind in the flesh. Yeah. Not just spirit. Galatians 4. God sent his son, born of a woman, flesh and blood, born under the law, 
the material application to redeem those under the law, the material laws of this world, that we might receive adoption to sonship. 1 John 4, this is love, right? But the love, he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. Why don't we say that so easily? Flesh and blood sacrificed. Not spirit. Flesh and blood was the atoning sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. The law requires, the material law, the spiritual law that governed the material required that blood be shed. God the Father doesn't have blood. God the Son. And of course, Isaiah 53, which we quote all the time, the picture of his suffering flesh. Surely he took up our pain and our bore our sufferings in his body, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his stripes we were healed. Past tense, ongoingly. He overcame death, and in order to do that, he had to be in the flesh. He overcame death so we could have eternal life. Number three, he came to reign over all creation. Now, this is some of my favorite, because I'm an animal lover and a nature lover. Luke 1 says his kingdom will go on forever, reign forever and ever without end. And Hebrews 1, the same thing, your throne, O God, will last forever. But Romans 8, I really love Romans 8, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. Wait, you only have decay in the flesh. It's going to be liberated from the decay of the flesh, a material state, and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God, the great environmental restoration. That's what I like to call it. And then Revelation 4, I love this. I was just reading it the other day in the Passion Translation. John is taken up to the third heaven. And, you know, lots of things he describes. And then an announcement goes forth. Who is worthy to open the scrolls? Who is worthy to open the scrolls? Dead silence. No one. What are these scrolls that no one's worthy to open? Well, the Passion Translation is good for its footnotes. Some say the scrolls were the title deed of the universe that contains the right of ownership and the timing and the plans of fulfilling the eternal destiny of all creation. Who is worthy? Dead silence. And John starts to weep. No one's worthy. And the angel said, John, look, the Lamb of God is worthy to open the scrolls, the, to, the title of ownership, to the timing and the plans of the fulfilling of the eternal destiny of all creation. The Lamb is worthy to open the scrolls. Why? What made him worthy? It says so in the next verses down. He was slaughtered. His blood was the price of redemption in order to have us, kingdom of priests, to reign mm -hmm. where? Yeah. On earth. That's right. mm -hmm. He is worthy because of he, his body was sacrificed. He is worthy to open the destiny, <laughs> the eternal destiny of all creation. And then finally, although not finally, but number four, he came to relate to us in the flesh. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to 
empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. What a compassionate God. He didn't have to. And Philippians 2, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. God, the one the Jews of old couldn't even give a name to because he's too magnificent, the great eternal I am God, took on the nature of a human being like us and found an appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. came in the flesh to reveal the Father in the flesh. He came to redeem mankind in the flesh. He came to reign over all creation in the flesh. And he came to relate to us in the flesh. And to indwell in us. God alone couldn't experience death. He's eternal. He couldn't experience death. He had to experience death. He had to be a man, a person. And man alone, as a man alone, he couldn't overcome sin and death. He had to be God and man, fully God, fully man in order to redeem us. No incarnation, God in the flesh, no atonement for sin, no victory over death, no indwelling in us. Now let me go back to our bodies. Because of God, my body is a sacrament. Remember what a sacrament is? A holy mystery. Humans have a material and an immaterial nature. As believers, we have an eternal spirit, but we have a body, intentionally a sacrament. Intentional, it was intentional. God was intentional with our creation. He knit us together in our mother's womb. He knew each day of our lives before we lived one. You are not a mistake. Nothing about you is a mistake. You may have been raised in hard circumstances, but you are not a mistake. He was intentional. And God took your humanity and my humanity and raised it to a greater dignity. He became like us in the flesh so we could become like him. Early church father Athanasius said, God took our humanity, our fleshly existence, our fleshly existence, as well as our spirit, our fleshly existence. Now, we, the church emphasizes spirit, 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 spirit. So it is not unimportant. Don't get me wrong. It is eternally important. But we never talk about the flesh, flesh, flesh. Let's get out of the Greek mindset. Our flesh is important to God. He, he took our humanity and raised our humanity to a greater dignity, a divine status. Jesus became like us in the flesh so we could become like him, divine. The sacramental value of every human body reveals to us the sacred and unrepeatable, meaning unique, mystery of that person. You, your personhood, is a mystery of God. He knit you together in your mother's womb. I wasn't there. I didn't know what he had in mind. But out you came. You are a mystery for me to see. What a blessing. Each person is a sacred manifestation of the divine. They're related, his incarnation and our fleshly existence. 
So, we're going to take communion shortly. So get your communion vessels ready, our little wafer, and our so-called grape juice. Our physical bodies are not to be taken lightly or derided for their weakness. It's okay. He knows us. He knows about us. He knows where we're strong. He knows where we're weak. <clears throat> we are intentionally created and intentionally a gift from God. When we take communion, we don't take air bread, right? That's right. And air juice. That's right. We take something mm -hmm. physical, material. I mean, it could be this fake little cracker. It could be real bread. We don't just pull something out of the air. We take a physical, tangible symbol of his physical, tangible being. Yes. We taste it. We feel it on our tongues and with our senses. We swallow it. We ingest it into our physical material body. We physically assimilate him through communion, kind of like a marriage in a way, right? The material elements in remembrance of a material God ingested into our material body to manifest material transformation. Do you know the Ashkenazi Jews have an interesting tradition after Passover? They take the afikomen, which is the matzah, the third matzah that's in between the other two, that is hidden, right? And the kids find it. And they take the afikomen and they put it in the cabinet. And they take it out every time somebody's sick and they eat of it. Contained in that tradition is what we do in communion. We take the Lord Jesus a representation of his physical and spiritual body into our physical and spiritual body to, ex to exchange a physical and spiritual transformation. I'm going to let you eat it in a minute. Jesus' incarnation has impacted our spirit, eternal life, our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, are being renewed and sanctified, and our material body is changing. Our body is a sacrament. Our body is for God. And believe me, God is for our body. He came for healing, not just salvation, but for healing. So together, let's take communion. Lord, I lift up the symbol of your body your physical body pierced for us because you intended for us to exchange our sins and our sickness for your woundedness. We do that right now, Lord. We take it, we eat of it, we feel it with all our five senses, and we ingest it for the wholeness of for which you paid. And you could take the wafer. Receive his healing. And Lord, there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. We are already spotless and clean, but we take this as a reminder <coughs> that we are spotless and clean. And we are under a new covenant, which you said is sealed by your blood. We are sealed in you. And we take this now in Jesus' name. Now, when you look to one another and you go out and exchange with others and you shake someone's hand or you give someone a hug, Remember that your body is a sacrament. And when you're next tempted to say, oh, I hate this about my body. Ah! I was an intentional gift. I was made by God, for God, 
and I welcome his indwelling spirit to be a living temple for God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then I guess